Uh, first of all, thank you to the tribunal for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's humbling in a way because this work of, of finding who's responsible for the murder of journalists is terribly important. So far this year, we have documented the, the death of 30 journalists around the world. 17 of those we have confirmed are related to their work. Uh, and we're continuing to research the other cases, and we will almost certainly find more. If history is any guide, uh, there may be two convictions related to those murders. We hope we can change that ratio somehow, and this is a good place to start. Um, my background is I started, uh, I have a political science uh, PhD from Columbia University. I spent over 20 years uh, as a foreign correspondent in Asia. Uh, reporting from different parts of the region. Um, I returned to the United States about 20 years ago and served as a foreign editor for the Knight Ritter uh, newspaper chain during the Iraq and the, um, and the Afghan wars. Um, I joined CPJ six years ago and I have, uh, you know, I'm, I uh, fo you know, follow the, manage the Asia program there. Uh, CPJ has been monitoring and documenting press freedom violations in Sri Lanka for many decades since our founding in 1982. Uh, CPJ work consists of three principal components. And the first, and probably the foundation and most important part, is documenting the violations. We go to great lengths to try to dis uh, discern the facts when journalists are attacked or when press freedom violations occur. We have a program of direct assistance to journalists that includes help uh, paying for legal, medical costs, relocation, emergency assistance, and we also provide uh, extensive security advice uh, for journalists on the ground, both digital and, and physical. And finally, uh, we are very active advocating on behalf of journalists uh, to governments. We, we, we travel around the world to meet with uh, government leaders and try to push uh, for the um, for the protection of journalists and the promotion of, of, of the free press. And, and to give you an example of this, my predecessor in this position, Bob Dietz, uh, left for Colombo immediately on the news of the murder of La Santa Wakramatunge, and he was able to provide documentation from the actual site of the murder within a few days. And uh, he also at that time visited Sandra at her home, um, and we have, um, we have many dozens of reports on attacks against journalists in Sri Lanka and regularly send staff to the country to report on the situation there. Most recently, just before the COVID-19 pandemic made travel impossibility. And to repeat this, reliably documenting the facts is the foundation of all of our work. And for this testimony, I'm relying on my own work, but also the extensive work of my CPJ colleagues. I would like to share facts uh, initially on a, a few emblematic cases that we have documented in Sri Lanka. And I would stress that while these cases have been relatively prominent, they are representative of the kind of, of repression that all journalists have faced there. Uh, this morning, um, Bashana already raised the case of, of uh, J.S. Tisanagayam, who, who was arrested after reporting, among other things, on the recruitment and training of child soldiers in 2008. He wrote a regular column for the Sunday Times, reflecting a moderate you know, Tamil point of view that was often highly critical of the government. He was arrested in March uh, 2008, and months later was charged with terrorism, for which he was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison in September 2009. Under intense international pressure, including uh, from CPJ, and after the Civil War had ended, he was granted a full pardon and allowed to emigrate to the United States in 2010. In fact, he had committed no crime other than reporting embarrassing news and publishing critical opinions. Another very important case from that era uh, was the case of uh, Keith Neuer. On the night of May 22, 2008, uh, the deputy, he, as deputy editor of the Nation newspaper, he was abducted in a white van when he returned home. His wife discovered the car outside the home with the engine still running. His abduction followed by less than two weeks a highly critical article he wrote entitled, 
An army is not a commander's private fiefdom. He was beaten in the van and later reportedly reported that he was stripped and suspended in the air and beaten again. The beating stopped when his abductors received a phone call from a higher authority apparently ordering them to stop. He was free the next day, barely able to walk, his body covered with contusions and bleeding from the air. He soon left for Australia and he did not return, although he has cooperated with investigators in the case. While arrests were eventually made some 10 years after the incident, all suspects were freed on bail and the case, like others, has ground to a halt following the election of Gotabaya Rajapaksa to the presidency. Just weeks after Neuer's capture and beating, Namal Pereira was again subject to a classic attempt at abduction while his car was chased on the street by motorcycles and an unmarked white van. The highly unusual twist of Pereira's story is that he survived and many years later identified his attackers in a police lineup. In 2008, Pereira was a freelance journalist and deputy head of the Sri Lanka Press Institute, a media advocacy group. Pereira had written critically of the government's war effort. He told me in 2017 that he was likely identified because his name card was in the wallet of Keith Neuer. Prior to the attack, Pereira had noticed the surveillance of, the off of his office at the Press Institute for several days. On the day of the attack, his car was followed when he left the office. Pereira's driver took evasive action, and when the attackers forced the car to stop, it was in a relatively public location. His attackers smashed the car's winds windscreen, dragged out Pereira, then another passenger, and beat both severely. But the attackers stopped and fled as a crowd gathered. Uh, Pereira ended up in the hospital, and there are pictures of him that, are, that show the extent of his injuries. Um, under the Sarasena government, progress in, in the investigation led to an arrest after he identified the attackers in this lineup. But after the change in the government, nothing has happened. Finally, I'd like to mention the case of Iqbal Athas. Iqbal Athas is a veteran defense correspondent for the Sunday Times, who is currently the political editor. In 1997, I, I, would, I would just point out that this uh, tendency toward uh, censorship began well before um, the Civil War was in, was in full swing, but, but it, it intensified during that period. In 1997 and 98, he wrote articles about the disappearance of 70,000 mortar shells purchased by the government, resulting in, in verbal and physical abuse by government officials and thugs. In 1998, after he wrote about irregularities in the aircraft purchases by the Air Force, two bodyguards of an, of, of an Air Force officer entered his home and threatened his family at gunpoint. These two were later convicted, and the government pr uh, provided guards at his home. Formal censorship came into force in, in 2000, and Athas found many, of his, many parts of his columns blanked out including criticism of the government's war effort against Tamil separatists. In 2005, the Sri Lanka president threatened to use the Official Secrets Act against Athas after he described the purchase of a British landing craft as a waste of money. In 2007, when Gotabaya Rajapaksa was defense secretary, after Athas reported corruption in a deal to purchase MiG fighters from Ukraine, the government withdrew security protection and orchestrated demonstrations outside his home. During the next several years, Athos was forced several times to go into temporary exile outside of Sri Lanka to seek safety, including around the time that Lasantha was murdered. I think it's worth quoting um, in 2007, I'm uh, sorry, 2008, uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, when he was defense secretary, gave an interview uh, to the, a local media. And let me quote from what he said. I think there is no need to report anything on the military. People do not want to know how many and what kind of arms we acquired. That is not media freedom. I tell without fear that I have power. I will not allow any of these things to be written. I told the president to bring press censorship in at the beginning. He went on to name several 
media companies um, and calling, calling them prostituted. You know, broadly speaking, uh, I see two patterns in these cases. The first is that journalists were attacked, and I say this with great certainty, by government-linked forces outside of any plausible law enforcement regime. The journalists were not accused of breaking any law. They were attacked and punished for fact-based reporting and opinion, and then warned against any repetition. Their reports found misconduct by the government and the military. Second, uh, laws were indeed used against some journalists, questionably so, but nonetheless, the government made use of law enforcement mechanisms to curb press freedom. We see this in the case of Iqbal Athas, where some of his work was legally censored and, and where he was threatened to use the Official Secrets Act against him. In Tissa's case, it was the use of the implausible use of the anti-terrorism laws that put him in prison and forced him to seek exile. The use of the prevention of terrorism law has continued to hang over journalists as a threat and has recently been employed. Lanka E News journalist Keithi Ratnyake was held on remand for eight months from last October under this law, ostensibly because of the obviously non-criminal act of warning an Indian diplomat about a possible attack on the embassy. But we are convinced he was in reality held in retaliation for critical reporting in the exile publication Lanka E News. After eight months, he was ordered released by the court for lack of any evidence. So, these, the, so the, the prevention of terrorism law is used as a threat. And most recently, CPJ has documented repeated harassment of prominent Tamil journalists by the anti-terror police, including forcing journalists to submit to hours of intrusive questioning at police offices. Uh, the, the PTA has become a sword of Damocles hanging over the heads of all Sri Lankan journalists. Human Rights Watch recently and very appropriately described the law as a legal black hole. So, and very recently, I would also add, I, I don't want to go into the details, but several journalists who have been uh, put under interrogation in this way have, have actually left the country uh, out of fear for what will happen to them. So in other words, uh, this kind of behavior by the government has not stopped. Following the 2015 elections and the installation of the Sarasena government, we saw important steps taken to investigate some cases. At a December 2017 UNESCO conference on impunity and cr for crimes against journalists, government officials complained of steep obstacles for investigating these cases, in part caused by the destruction of evidence by the previous outgoing government of Mahinda Rajapaksa. Nonetheless, in the investigations continued for several years. Suspects were identified and arrests were made. But then, universally, bail was granted and the process came to a halt with the election of Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Yes, there remain severe evidentiary difficulties in, in sustaining convictions in these cases, but the primary obstacle is political whether or not there is willpower in these cases on the part of the government to seek justice. There's no secret today that Sri Lanka's future is highly uncertain with the government under siege and a declaration of a state of emergency. Journalists face an unknown set of risks should they continue to speak out on these cases and the potential, uh, and the potential legal response of the current uh, president of Sri Lanka and others. These potential threats by the government are becoming explicit. On May 6th, just last week, the government issued regulations threatening criminal action under the public security ordinance, ordinance that contain the following language, which I've somewhat shortened here. No person shall, by word of mouth or by any other means whatsoever, spread any information likely to cause public alarm, public disorder, or racial violence on, on which it is likely to incite committing of an offense. Our experience in Sri Lanka and elsewhere is that governments cannot be trusted when given such broad authority to use legal means against critics who, whose truthful statements threaten to undermine their rule. This is precisely the situation facing many uh, in Sri Lanka who seek an end to impunity for the crimes against journalists. Should Gotabaya Rajapaksa remain in power, we can anticipate the possibility of escalating threats against journalists who speak out.
Thank you very much. I would love, if we can, um, to talk a little bit about patterns. And about? Patterns. Yeah. The, um, because I think through the, the, your work and investigation and factual analysis at CPJ, I think you can help us and get the, the tribunal to understand. At, a level, at, at different levels, first, I guess my question is about what patterns do we find on the attacks? You mentioned that the, all the journalists had attacked, um, but if you could describe exactly what those attacks, if they come with threats, if we can establish that there is uh, laying a foundation of, of fear or restrict or forcing the journalist uh, to restrict himself or herself. I mean, you just first on the attack, and then I'll follow up with other patterns as part of the of the venom. I think, uh, as we discussed this morning. Uh, I think you have to bifurcate the country into the north and, and the northeast uh, and the eastern part of the country because the, the Tamil journalists face a different sort of threat compared to the Sinhala journalists. And we have been told, the editors of, of prominent Tamil newspapers, they do in fact receive regular phone calls uh, from authorities warning them or asking for sources. These are very threatening. and, and it. It, it, with the result that they have to self-censor, they have to they have to limit on what what they uh, what they write about. These kinds of um, anti-terror interrogations of Tamil journalists that that I mentioned, this doesn't happen in the, in the, with, the, with in the same way with the Sinhala community. It, is is this what you're asking? And then from there, actually, very uh, for the second question, very much related to that. In the also understand for the panel, the patterns on precisely that, the application of the laws to intimidate and to harass. They're using, you may mention, Official Secrets Act, the Prevention Terrorist Act, and now more recently, the Public Security Ordinance. Could, can you just, because we, we know that they use it, but maybe perhaps more detail on how they put that into motion to, to coerce and to, to stop the work of journalism. Well, I think that the, the most outstanding you know, part of this history is that most of the attacks on journalists take place outside of any law enforcement uh, you know, regime. And if you look at these killings, the, the white van abductions, the beatings of journalists, um, you know, the, um, the predominantly, the fact that the Tamil journalists are predominantly the ones who are murdered uh, in journalists in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Now, some of these some of these murders um, of the Tamil journalists, uh, they also uh, were carried out by Tamil extremists. Not all of them, you know, relate directly back to the government. Um, but you know, the the use of these uh, 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 the Prevention of Terrorism Act, it it you don't have to arrest very many journalists under this. Uh, under this kind of regime to get the point across. And it, it, it just sends out a warning to all journalists that they have to conform. Sorry, the, where, um, and I know we also hinted it this morning, but in your opinion and your, uh, it was an informed opinion through the investigation of CPJ and beyond, where are the owners of the media outlets, the executives, I mean, who is behind, perhaps double question, who is behind the ownership and management of these media outlets and what is their uh, response and attitude towards the attacks on journalists and freedom of expression? Well, this, this is, the, I, I, my, my knowledge in this area is limited, um, but it, the, the major media in Sri Lanka are owned by several large corporations, uh, and th these these are people who have close ties to government officials. Uh, they're part of an of, of an elite in Sri Lanka, and they have every interest in trying to stay in business. The media is it's, it can be very profitable, um, and so so, yeah, so yes, they have an interest in moderating the kind of coverage uh, that takes place in the country. Perfect. And 
I suppose the, the situation in Sri Lanka and also came up this morning, we cannot ignore that it is pretty complicated as it is right now. Uh, journalists and, and freedom of expression were very, very much included. And what are the measures, the CPJ, you mentioned that you also, you protect journalists or put measures in place to protect them before they are attacked. How are you guys addressing this in the current moment and, and what, what are the priorities? Um, we publish security guides. Uh, both uh, for physical and digital security. We recently translated them uh, both into Sinhala and Tamil languages, and we've uh, you know, broadly distributing that. We are helping to pay for the relocation of some journalists um, to, so they can temp temporarily seek safety uh, you know, outside the country. We don't provide a long-term solution, but we, we do help you know, to relocate you know, journalists when they're in trouble. These are the principal you know, means that we have. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you would like to add before I pass it to the panel? No, we can pass to the panel. That's okay, fine. thank you very much. I don't know if the panel has any questions. Can we see on the screen, please, for the remote um, members? Yes, I think uh, Gil Beringer has a question. Microphone, Gil. Thanks. Uh, have any of the journalists tried um, maintaining their own security, either a bodyguard or even an armored car? Um, these have been tried in the Philippines, but of course they're very expensive, so rarely used. Yeah. But I was wondering if, if some kind of physical protection was was used at all. Yeah, yeah I know that um, some of the senior editors or executives at the, the news groups do have armored cars. Yeah. The seniors. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, this but, doesn't you know this doesn't extend to yeah the ordinary, that says ordinary it all. hacks. Yeah, and, and sorry, you you mentioned security guides. Could you describe them a little bit further? Well, we've accumulated a lot of experience over the years on how journalists can cover riots, for example, or demonstrations, um, and you know, and try to keep try to keep themselves safe. I mean, some of this is some of this is obvious. Uh, for example, stand to the side, don't stand in the middle. But others is not necessarily. Don't you know, don't put a camera around your neck, a camera strap around your neck, because uh, that you know you can be you can be yanked. Uh, digital security is more complicated, and um, you know a lot of journalists. They work for, um, they don't get paid very much. Uh, their their employers uh, don't provide very much uh, information about how to protect themselves. Um, I mean, just but just for example, um, in right now, if you you know you have journalists have so much information on their phone, and. Uh, so we tell them wipe it clean if you're going out, you know, in, in a situation, you know, and 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 you can restore it later. Uh, but you don't want to be you don't want to be caught by authorities with detailed information about who you've been phoning. Yeah, I mean, but this sort of thing, we, we it's it's fairly extensive and 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 a lot of it's it's not difficult to implement. Yeah, great, thanks. Marina, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just one quick question. Uh, we heard in the case of Mexico that one of the problems confronting journalists is precisely what you were saying uh, a moment ago, uh, that uh, many journalists, uh, staff reporters, for instance, they are not very well paid. I mean, it is a precarious uh, it is a precarious job for many of them. Uh, how much do you think that this is a problem in the case of Sri Lanka? How much this uh, as an influence, as an impact in the in the safety in in, in I mean in the vulnerability of uh, these journalists? Thank you. I mean, I think there are two issues. One, if we're talking about how to cover widespread demonstrations, th this is an issue that comes to the fore. If we're talking about state-sponsored attacks on journalists, I, I don't think the level of pay necessarily is an issue, except that 
Um, if you're not very well paid and you're trying to survive, you're very likely to take fewer risks by, by criticizing the government. Um, but these kind of, um, I mean, the, the, the people who I've described here who were attacked were fairly well-known critics of the government. Uh, and I don't think the issue of you know, poor pay or treatment necessarily came into, into play in these cases. Um, while uh, I'm sorry, while the uh, the point of the uh, I mean I'm trying to understand how much uh, a journalist can uh, um, uh, make his job in a in um, can have a certain degree of independency of uh, when. Uh, most of the mainstream media uh, belongs to large group, large uh, corporations, uh, where to have an independent media itself is uh, requires uh, financing, and this is very difficult to achieve. So I'm trying to understand, uh, beside all uh, what we have heard about the responsibilities of the, I mean the the. Uh, the responsibilities of the government and the army and the power, uh, uh, trying to understand uh, what are the conditions of work for journalists, uh, beside the well-known, the, 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 the senior editors. So uh, um, uh, ownership of the media, financing for independent media, for instance, electronic independent media, uh, and the condition of uh, work for for the journalist but, uh, so thank you yeah, I mean I think just Sh Sri Lanka in in that sense is not necessarily different from what's taking place across the world which is that uh, you know print journalism um, is not as sustainable as it once was the, the new models for uh, independent online, principally online journalism, are still being created. There are success, certainly success stories, um, and uh, you know you could say Lanky e News is, is a success story in a sense, but that's an exile media out of London. Um, but, but it is, uh, you know, the, it's frankly it's inspiring when you think about it because the the, the economic conditions for for journalism and for journalists are becoming more and more difficult, and yet more and more people want to do it because there's a there's a thirst to tell the truth and there's a thirst to know the truth by by people who consume this media thank you thank you eduardo thank you thanks steve for your testimony i would like to to ask you if you can elaborate a little bit of something that you said in your written testimony sent to this tribunal. In one paragraph you said, meanwhile, the infrastructure of achieving justice for past human rights violation has collapsed. And then you say investigation, investigators fled the country. Could you please elaborate a little bit of that? Why you're saying that the judiciary system collapsed and uh, impunity is the rule and not the exception. Thank you. Well, I think we, we saw the, you know, the green shoots of and during the, uh, after the, the, the 2015 election, the, you know, the, the CID, the Criminal Investigation Division was pursuing some of these cases and um, they were arresting people uh, and they were put out on bail. So you had the beginnings of a serious um, uh, investigative effort um, but it never really got past that beginning beginning stage, uh, and after the uh, the 2019 elections, um, I think we're going to learn more about this tomorrow um, in, in in some of the testimony. So maybe I should leave it to them. But it is that those investigative efforts appear to have collapsed, uh, and the uh, it, it it is uh, you know there's been no further progress in any in any of the cases as far as I'm 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 aware. Yeah, so I have two questions based on what you said just now. One is, I know you said that it doesn't require many cases to be filed against journalists for the message to get out, but do we have any data 
of actually how many journalists have been charged under the uh, PTA, under the Public Safety Ordinance. And I'm presuming that both these are non-bailable? I, I don't know, so that's what I'm asking. Yeah. That's one question. And the other one, again, about censorship. Um, you said that uh, the Tamil uh, newspapers and media houses often get these uh, questions asked after something is published. But you mentioned that uh, Iqbal... Uh, Iqbal Athas, yeah. Athas, his articles were prevented from being published. So I, I wasn't able to understand. Does that mean... There, there was a formal censorship regime put into place in the early 2000s. Okay. And so a lot of the newspapers appeared with, with, um, you know, with copy blanked out. Um, it was a formal regime. There was a censor in the newspaper office who had to approve all the copy. This took place, this, uh, this uh, you know, persisted for a few years. While, while the war was on? Yes. Yeah. And on the P PSA and... Uh, you yeah. know, there are relatively few. Um, as far as I know, there are relatively few journalists actually charged on, on, under these acts. Or in, or in jail? Are there any journalists in jail under any of these? Um, well, there's there this one case that I mentioned um, of uh, a journalist who was in jail for eight months. Um, at, it was a Sinhala journalist, actually, a former mili military officer who turned to journalism, and he was he's kind of a thorn in the side of the government. And so they, they brought these charges against him um, and held him in, um, held him in, in jail for, for eight months, um, preventive detention. Um, and... Uh, and then, you know, they, his case was he had heard that there was a potential for attack on the um, Indian embassy. And he reported that to the embassy. The, an officer at the embassy phoned the Sri Lankan security services, uh, which went to the journalist and said, well, why didn't you tell us? Um, and, you know, that, that with this, in, this intelligence. And so they, they arrested him and put him in jail, which is it's, it's, it's pretty nonsensical. Um, but that was that was that particular case, but these you know the uh, these cases of interrogating the the Tamil journalists, which we have documented on and we documented on our website. Um, you know, this is a, there, there's a very clear threat to put these people in jail, and I mean they 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 were interrogated because they covered demonstrations, for example, or they um, they, they this one journalist there was a um, a um, Commemoration for for uh, Tamils who were killed in the sinking of a of a ferry, and this was considered to be a controversial thing, and, and so the police were upset about it. So they picked him up and interrogated him. But I mean, that that's gives a sense for the kind of uh, you know constricted environment in, in which Tamil journalists continue to operate. Then, and it's I I I agree with the statement this morning that. That this is a lot of this is underreported. Frankly, it becomes a routine part of life. You know, if you, you know, when these things first occur, you may think, "Oh, this is newsworthy, and we're going to report it." But after a while, if you keep getting these phone calls and you keep getting these kind of interrogations, after a while, it becomes kind of a routine fact of life, um, and and it just prevents any kind of meaningful news coverage. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I understand well. You said that is uh, Tamil journalists many times are killed by Tamil extremists, not by not by government. No. Yes, if you look at the if you look at the cases, we we believe that some of them some journalists were were killed by the LTTE, or. I mean, it was a very complicated period. There was a, uh, a, you know, a Tamil faction that was allied with the government, which also attacked some journalists. So this is not, strictly speaking, uh, many of the murders were not strict, uh, the direct responsibility of the government. However, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a single arrest uh, associated with any of the murders of, of Tamil journalists. In all of these cases where we're talking about um, you know, the investigations and arrests, it all has to do with the Sinhala community. So this, this, and I think this is just something that Tamils, they, they live with it. And, sorry, and why, why they, uh, do they attack journalists? What, 
Because Tamil journalists also were critical of, of the Tamil separatists. I mean, they were, they were, they were doing their job as journalists and, and re reporting what was going on. I mean, it, it was, a, the Civil War was a terrible, complicated um, and brutal period in, in Sri Lankan history. And another question, uh, the CID? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's because uh, I, I read about that they did an investigation first in the cases and in the La Santa case and others, but there are really, there were really independent, uh, like I am Mexican and I know that <laughs> if you have everything failed, also the prosecutors and investigators and police failed. So for me it was like kind of strange that some part uh, it does, does well. So, well, you know, I think this is the way I look at it. I mean, I don't have the detailed in, in for, detailed knowledge of the inside workings of these institutions. Institutions can be corrupt. Corrupt institutions can uh, can employ individuals who are not corrupt, uh, individuals who are still idealistic. So it's it's perfectly reasonable to me to think that there are people in these organizations who actually want to carry out justice. Um, and they're, you know, the, the heads of the organizations, they, they might tolerate this for a while, even if they have, you know, political pressures not to allow it to go forward. I mean, it's, it's a game of, uh, of, of creating appearances, particularly, you know, after, uh, after the 2015 election, the international human rights community really breathed this high of relief that the old regime appeared to be out of power. Now, of course, that wasn't really true because you had people from the defense ministry who were accused of organizing the attacks against journalists who were actually still in power, not, not the leaders, of the, not the leaders. Um, but it wasn't a clean break with the past by any means. And so, um, but the, I mean, I, I was, I was at, at that conference in uh, the, as the UNESCO conference, I think it was late, you know, 2017. And, there was a sense, so Sri Lanka is a good news story. Sri Lanka is, is going through, you know, these reforms. And um, there was a presentation that was made about the progress that was uh, of these various murder cases. Um, and basically, it came, and in the end of the day, it came to nothing. The only, the only killing of a journalist that was actually solved was that of a, was a journalist who was killed in a mass bombing where he was not, he was not the target. Um, it was, the, but he just happened to, to be there. Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, ask if you would say a little more about um, the uh, t period in which the uh, the new government uh, withdrew from the UN Human Rights Resolutions, and I think in your written statement you said that they expressed a promise to pardon the military who were in jail. And was that an explicit uh, statement? Could you say a little more about that? Uh, yes, uh, the, the president, Roger Pox, he didn't, he wasn't part, there was no one in jail at the time, but he was, he was going to clear the records of, um, of military personnel who were accused of committing atrocities in the context of the Civil War. I'm, I haven't, I'm not, clear how far that has progressed. I gather a, a, a commission of some sort was set up, and, but I'm not certain how far that has progressed. Yes, Gil, you had another question? Um, yeah, um, it's rather long, but uh, and it's kind of a statement and a question, um, and it's about methodology. Um, I want to thank you, Stephen, for your testimony, but also for the work that you and the CPJ <clears throat> are doing. Uh, it's important. Somebody needs to do it, and you're doing it well. I, uh, just as a preface, I've been doing research in the Philippines for many years um, on the killing of lawyers and on the killing of journalists more, more recently, of which there are plenty. And I have discussions with, uh, we have a monitoring group, the International Association of People's Lawyers. 
and I have discussions with other monetarian groups um, about one thing in particular, many things, but one in particular I want to raise with you and, and just explore it a little bit. And that is, you talked about um, the, the, the killing of journalists that are related to their work. Now, I, I, I actually have some difficulty with that. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. First, as, as we know, the, there, there are few really comprehensive um, investigations, all sorts of problems there, but, but we, as a result, we don't actually know um, or have the evidence uh, to tell us whether it was related to their work. We can only assume from the circumstances, I guess, and I, I don't even know what related to their work actually means in a, you know, in a fundamental sense. Um, and I think there are some cases that illustrate that related to their work can mean the fact that, well, in, in many of these countries, and certain, certain, well, let, let me put it this way. Some judges in the Philippines are, are killed because they're judges and somebody wants to, to rob their money because they know that judges get well paid. Now, it may be a sexual crime. It may be a land dispute. It may be many things unrelated to their, to their work in one sense, but clearly related to their work because of who they are. The status they have means they have money and therefore they're a target to be robbed. Further, taking it a little bit further, um, and there's a case in Mexico, which I, I find really interesting, which you, you might want to have a look at, and that's Michelle Simon. Um, in, in, uh, in, 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 in countries like Mexico, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Syria, um, there's a lot of fear out there amongst journalists. Uh, and we've heard all about that and for good reason. It seems to me that in those circumstances, when the news gets out that a journalist has been killed, that feeds the fear. It doesn't, to me, <laughs> it, I, I don't think it matters that much, actually, why the person was killed. After you've had 30, 40, 50, 70, whatever, killed, and there's this, a, a, a state of fear amongst the profession, and they hear, they learn that somebody else has been knocked off, doesn't that have a very negative impact upon them? Um, so, I, you know, I'd just like to hear how you feel about that. It's just a kind of methodological issue, I guess. You know, we feel... We feel that our credibility is boosted if we can produce evidence or facts that a journalist killing was in some way related to their work. Now, sometimes we deliberate this over a long time. Um, we, we're we don't go there automatically when a journalist is killed. Uh, I mean, I, I, we, we have this, um, I'll just I'll use the case of Pakistan. Because so a lot of you know, journalists are killed in Pakistan, and the local community, no matter what the reason, no matter what the cause, will immediately add this to their list of, of journalists killed, and we don't, we just don't, uh, you know, do that, you know, so easily. I mean, there was a, there was a case, um, um, which we we're deliberating over now, in which a journalist was murdered uh, by a drug gang. Um, but he also was an informer with the police, and so we, so we have him. We we have him on our website of what we call as an unconfirmed case, meaning we we can't be certain he was killed. It might have been related to his work, but we can't confirm that. Uh, and that's what I, that's the difference. When I said thirty journalists have been killed this year and seventeen, we confirm it's not by uh, obviously a legal standard. Um, it's by our own best judgment of what the facts, you know, tell us 
that a, that uh, someone was killed, in fact, uh, you know, related to their work. And we, we, we will change that classification if we get more information that shows us one way, one way or the other. But we feel our credibility is on the line um, with this, because we don't, I mean, people can, can get murdered for all kinds of reasons. We had a, another case in Pakistan of a very prominent uh, uh, woman broadcaster from Balochistan um, who was murdered by her husband. And some people said it, she was murdered because she was a journalist. And we said, well, we don't know. We can't, we can't make that you know, conclusion. Um, I'm, husbands kill their wives for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but this is, we, we think this is a very important issue on which uh, we put a lot of our credibility. And it's one of the reasons that our numbers for murdered journalists are often lower than other organizations when they tally them. Does that answer your question? Here. Yes, yes. I, I, I wanted to hear what you had to say. That's fine. I, I don't know if I will re, re, well, How many journalists did you consider in Sri Lanka has been killed related to their professions? I'd have to go back and look at the number. The number that we have for that period, 20, um, 2005 to 2015, is 10 murdered. In other words, specifically killed uh, for their work. Nine of those are Tamil and one of them is Sinhala. You know, uh, the number of journalists killed, and if you put in media workers, that, that, that is one of the reasons that the number you heard this morning was much higher. Because we don't, although we, we do now, um, we ha uh, keep track of media workers who are killed, uh, we, we don't calculate the numbers in just the same way. So there are a number of journalists, I mean, for example, there was a bombing in, in Jaffna uh, during the war um, where I think... Uh, I don't think any journalists were killed, but the media workers, you know, counting people, sales, sales circulation, you know, were killed. So they, so they will appear on our site after a certain, you know, period of time, but we don't count them as, as journalists, as murdered journalists. And disappear? Do you have uh, disappear, exiled? I don't know, you have yes, we have, we, have, we have that. I, I, I have to look at the numbers on that one. If the panel is, is done with the questions, I just have one question that I would like to clarify. Just to be clear, it's relevant on impunity. Um, when you talked about credible steps taken to investigate or to inquire about the killing of the, of the journalist, was that subject to a particular period or a particular change in government and leadership? Or that was throughout? I mean, could we be more specific about those steps taken in the time frame speaking? Uh, you mean after the change in government in 2015, there ap appeared to be... If they were, exactly. If they were associated to that change in government. Yes, and yes, for sure. Now, I, I can't speak to what might have been going on in the CID prior to that. Now, what um, we, were, we understood that... that there, I believe that there were investigations taking place, but we're also told, after at, uh, you know, at, after the election, that evidence was destroyed. There was an intentional destruction of some of that evidence, and I, and I, um, you know, the, this, the government changed, but the, the inspectors of the CID didn't necessarily change, and uh, so there, uh, I, I can't tell you the inside history of exactly what was going on. And to your knowledge, after two thousand nineteen things became like dead again or stalled again or was any steps taken yeah as far as i know well there there was there was um there were continued some hearings and in in the case of pragith there were there were some continued hearings but they were delayed for all kinds of reasons there was covid the uh, you know the covid-19 uh, pandemic um, but I think the overall sense is that there wasn't any serious continuing investigation into any of the cases after that Thank you very much. Uh, that's it from me.